friends, a warm welcome from my side as well. Um, it's good to, to be able to share with you at the beginning of this new year. Um, and so I add my New Year greetings to everyone. I kind of, I was saying outside, I already feel like I'm halfway through the year, um, but uh, I have to keep reminding myself that it is a new year. Um, and, and unlike, uh, uh, you know, every year I, I used to think that things might get better this year. Um, but uh, a couple of years ago, I, I realized things aren't necessarily going to get better but God is with us every step of the way. And so no matter what happens, and we've seen quite a, few, quite a, quite a lot in the last couple of years, God is, is always with us, and so we trust that. And so we light the candle as a reminder of God's presence always with us, like a light that shines in the darkness. The darkness cannot extinguish the light. The light always outshines the darkness. And so we give thanks for God's presence with us always. Shall we join our voices in song as we sing together, all people that on earth do dwell. The words are on the overhead and I invite you to stand if you're able as we sing together, all people that on earth do dwell. Three. 
Let's pray together. Gracious and loving God, your voice thunders in the night and sings love songs in the morning. Your voice tumbles raging rapids and ripples pools of peace. Your voice snaps trees in two and can mend broken hearts with a sigh. We give glory to your name, God of our lives. Guided by the grace, guided by grace, you became the champion of justice. Beloved of the sightless, you release those who we would shackle. Broken for our sake, you shape our souls into silhouettes hanging in the hall of servants. We give glory to your grace, child of the waters. You cup your hands around our flickering faith, breathing us to new life. You call us to work for justice, teaching us intentional acts of service. You immerse us in courage, daring us to speak words of hope. We give glory to your love, spirit of wonder. We try to stop Jesus from coming into our lives, patient God, for we know how disruptive he can be. He wants us to preach the gospel with our lives, but we prefer to complain how hard that is to do. He wants us to do what is right, yet wrongdoing comes so easily for us. He would like us not to give up until justice is done, but we just don't seem to have the time. We confess because we know we need to be forgiven by you, glory and grace. Bathe us in the life-giving waters of your mercy so we can come up from the water ready to do good for others, to give you all the praise, to learn justice, grace and hope from your servant, Jesus Christ. We give you the glory now and always, God in community, holy in one, even as we pray as we were taught, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We turn now to our scripture readings for this morning, and the first reading is taken from Isaiah chapter 42 and verses 1 to 9. Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 to 9. The Lord says, Here is my servant whom I strengthen, the one I have chosen, with whom I am pleased. I have filled him with my spirit, and he will bring justice to every nation. He will not shout or raise his voice or make loud speeches in the streets. He will not break off a bent reed or put out a flickering lamp. He will bring lasting justice to all. He will not lose hope or courage he will establish justice on earth. Distant lands eagerly wait for his teaching. God created the heavens and stretched them out. God fashioned the earth and all that lives there. God gave life and breath to all its people. And now the Lord God says to his servant, I, the Lord, have called you and given you power to see that justice is done on earth. Through you I will make a covenant with all peoples. Through you I will bring light to the nations. You will open the eyes of the blind and set free those who sit in dark prisons. I alone am the Lord your God. No other God may share my glory. I will not let idols share my praise. The things I predicted have now come true. Now I will tell you of new things, even before they happen. And then we turn to Matthew chapter 3 and verses 13 to 17. 
At that time, Jesus arrived from Galilee and came to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. But John tr tried to make him change his mind. I ought to be baptized by you, John said, and yet you have come to me. But Jesus answered him, let it be so for now, for in this way we shall do all that God requires. So John agreed. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water. Then, the heaven, was, the, then heaven was opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God coming down like a dove and alighting on him. Then a voice said from heaven, This is my own dear Son, with whom I am well pleased. Thanks be to God for this word to us. Friends, I think that the parallels between Isaiah's servant and Jesus are, are fairly clear. And we, we believe that, that Jesus fulfills what Isaiah is talking about. Jesus becomes the servant, the Messiah, the promised one who changes everything. And uh, you can see that because um, in, in the Isaiah passage, we read at the beginning, Here is my servant, whom I strengthen, the one I have chosen, with whom I am pleased. I have filled him with my spirit. And then, of course, at Jesus' baptism, we read that the heavens were opened, the spirit descended on him, and a voice was heard saying, This is my beloved child, in whom I am well pleased. By submitting to John's baptism, Jesus is aligning himself with God's purpose. He will fulfill what Israel has failed to fulfill. Right at the very beginning, when God called Jacob, he said, I, I'm calling you to, to, to start to, to be a nation who will be a light to all the nations. And in the Isaiah passage in verses 6 and 7, we read, I, the Lord, have called you and given you power to see that justice is done on earth. Through you, I will make a covenant with all peoples. Through you, I will bring light to the nations. And so Jesus aligns himself with God's purpose to bring light to all the nations, to bring God's justice, to, to renew the covenant that is not just for some, but for all. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. Just as God calls Israel to embrace God's plans through Isaiah, John calls, uh, John calls people to do the same. A little bit earlier in, in Matthew's Gospel, we read that John the Baptist came to the desert of Judea and started preaching, turn away from your sins, repent from your sins, because the kingdom of heaven is near. John was the man the prophet Isaiah was talking about when he said, Someone is shouting in the desert, prepare a road for the Lord, make a straight path for him to travel. And then in verse 11, he, John says, I baptize you with water to show that you have repented. But the one who will come after me will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He is much greater than I am, and I am not good enough even to carry his sandals. God's perfect reign, God's kingdom, the heaven is within our grasp. We are called to turn around, to repent and embrace that kingdom, that reign, to become a part of fulfilling that perfect reign on earth as it is in heaven. I think that's what the story of Jesus' baptism in Matthew's gospel is about. Jesus approaches John to be baptized, and John objects. I should be baptized by you, not you by me, John says. Jesus' response might seem a bit strange at first glance. He says, it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. The version I read was a little bit different, but in essence, that's what he's saying. It is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Now, one would think that if there was anyone who had fulfilled all righteousness, 
it was Jesus. Now, I think that Eugene Peterson's translation in the message captures what Jesus is actually saying so beautifully. He translates it, that verse, in this way. God's work, putting things right all these centuries, is coming together right now in this baptism. God's work, putting things right all these centuries, is coming together right now in this baptism. All that God has been doing culminates in Jesus and continues through Jesus' followers. I think that in a very real sense, in his baptism, Jesus is making a public declaration that he is going to take the side of God's justice, as we read about in Isaiah. He was going to set about promoting God's work of righting the wrongs, lifting the burdens from the oppressed. He was going to shine the light of God into all the dark places of the world. And that's exactly what he does. And the world responds in the way the world always does. We don't like having our ways criticized or our misdeeds exposed. And so they tried to stifle Jesus by labeling him as a criminal and executing him. But those of us who've shared in Jesus' baptism cannot give our approval to the ways of the world. By sharing Christ's baptism, we've taken on the same calling as he has, to shine the light of God's truth and God's peace and God's compassion and God's mercy. In short, the light of God's justice into all the dark places of the world. But our idea of justice is very different from the Bible's picture of justice. In our world, justice is something that happens in courtrooms. Justice is about arbitrating disputes and determining guilt or innocence. And then, of course, handing down punishment for crimes. But in the Bible, God's justice means that the hungry are fed. Prisoners are set free. The blind receive their sight. Those who are bowed down are lifted up. And the immigrants and the widows and the orphans have someone to watch over them. Simply put, God's justice is the light that shines into all the dark places of the world and makes it possible for all people to thrive equally. It's important to notice the way in which the servant in Isaiah establishes this kind of justice. Isaiah says it this way, A bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not quench. Eugene Peterson, as usual, captures it so beautifully in the, in the, the message. He says, He won't brush aside the bruised and the hurt, and he won't disregard the small and insignificant. In addition, the servant is to be a light to the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. That's what we read about in that Isaiah passage, and it's fulfilled in Jesus. Now, if you're thinking that that sounds like a very strange kind of justice, I'm not surprised. In fact, it would seem that this is the very opposite of the way we think authorities ought to establish justice in our world. We think the authorities should crack down on criminals without lifting a finger to do anything about the social conditions that create criminals in the first place. We want the authorities to carry out the war on drugs but I'm not sure that that includes coming up with ways to, to help those who use illegal drugs to escape from the darkness around them. And when anyone anywhere does violence to us or to our people, we believe that we have a right, even an obligation, to respond to that violence with more violence, whether that means waging war or executing violent offenders. But that is our 
version of justice. And it only serves to spread the darkness in our world. Our justice looks very different from God's justice. Our justice is a justice of vengeance and force and hostility, rather than creating the conditions that make for life. Our justice simply leads to a culture of death rather than life-giving restoration. But God's justice takes, takes place not through vengeance, but through forgiveness. God's justice takes place not through violence, but through compassion. God's justice takes place not through hostility, but by mercy. And it's a justice that leads to peace. Life in all its fullness for all people. And in order to achieve God's justice that rights the wrongs and creates conditions in which all people can thrive, we have to employ God's ways instead of our own. Just as Jesus made a public declaration that he was going to take the side of God's justice, he was going to do God's work of righting wrongs and lifting the burdens of the oppressed. He was going to shine the light of God into all the dark places of the world in the same way we are called to do the same. Our baptism declares that we are God's children called to live out God's plan. Today, I'm going to invite us to reaffirm our baptism commitment, to remember who we are and who we are called to be, to be reminded that we are God's beloved children, building for God's beloved reign on earth as it is in heaven. Let's pray together. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks and praise that in your mercy you brought us to baptism and there gave us Jesus' holiness in exchange for our sin and impurity. Thank you for our parents who brought us up in the faith and to baptism. Thank you for other people whom you used to bring us the gospel and thank you for our pastors and teachers in the faith. We pray for the baptized people of God, that we may hang on to your promises in true faith, especially when we experience the wilderness of sin and evil within, and temptations and trials from without. Strengthen us with your Holy Spirit, so that Jesus' victory may be our victory. Have mercy on those in need, those who are struggling because of domestic violence and breakdown, those who are suffering from harmful behavior and hurting relationships. Heal, restore, and renew, Lord. We pray for the sick, those who are disabled, those in hospital, those facing death. Show them the light of the gospel. Provide helpers and carers and medical resources and heal both body and soul. Be with those among us who are sick, or recovering from surgery, and in particular, those we name before you in our hearts in silence. Gracious and loving God, you have shown us your love and salvation in the baptism of your Son. Accept these prayers of your children in the name of Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We have worshipped God for God's goodness and given thanks for God's love and grace. We have confessed and repented of our sin. Let us then share in the symbolic meal of remembrance that unites us with God and draws us together as the family of God. As Jesus and his disciples shared their last Passover meal together, Jesus took some bread in his hands, and after he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is a reminder of my body, which is given for you. Eat this as a way of remembering me. After the meal, 
Jesus took a cup of wine in his hands and said, This is a reminder of my blood, and with it God makes a new agreement with you. Drink this and remember me. The Lord meant that when we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we remember how his death and resurrection saves us from the power of sin and death, and how Christ Jesus gives us the strength as he lives with us until the day when he will return to destroy sin and death forever. And so let us remind ourselves of the heart of the Christian faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, as Jesus asked us to do, we share this meal together remembering him. We ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would unite us as your family, and that together we might be united to Jesus in a bond of love and commitment to serving him in the world. Amen. When we eat the bread that we break, isn't that a sharing in the body of Christ? By sharing in the same loaf of bread, we become one body, even though there are many of us. And so let us pray together a prayer of preparation. Lord, we come to your table, trusting in your mercy and not in any good thing we have done. We are not even worthy to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are so amazing that you even ask us to eat with you at the table. As we share the bread and wine, unite us with Jesus, that we may forever live in him and he in us. Amen. We thank you, Lord, that you have filled us with the bread of life, given us a chance to renew our relationship with Jesus, and allowed us to be a part of your family. Jesus, you have given yourself for us. Now we give ourselves for others. It is your love that has changed our lives. May your love flow through us as we serve you with joy. Amen. Friends, we're going to close off by singing together hymn number 691. Um, come let us sing of the wonderful love, tender and true.
Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.